And then you enter it into your favorite search engine. Um, you don't get a love heart like last night, um, but instead uh, you get the answer of six in this case. So we know to use six levels of tiles is sufficient. Um, if you create more levels of tiles, you're, well, it's kind of redundant, so there's no need. Um, uh, you just use more disk space for something that's unnecessary. Um, the disadvantage of this is that uh, this method is that when you assume that a <coughs> level other than one t other than the one that uh, the raster resolution is, you end up with something ugly like that because it's interpolating on the fly. Uh, GeoServe is interpolating on the fly. Um, we want it to um, look a bit better than that. Um, because these are tiles, we know that they're always going to be shown at a fixed scale. So there is a, pre a better way. Uh, we pre-interpolate. So basically, we create a raster um, for each of the zoom levels uh, that we have. So as you can see, there's actually uh, about 11 zoom levels for the rasters. And each one, we create a separate raster layer for. And that raster layer will always look very good when you zoom to, to it at that level. Um, and the way you do that, you're basically just resizing um, your original raster ahead of time, which is what that top line is doing there. Um, so we resize it. Uh, I'm using the Lanxos, the, don't I pronounce that, interpolation, which from various testing gave us the best quality, but it's really slow. Um, doesn't matter because we're doing it ahead of time. You don't want to do it on the fly, though. Um, I don't think it's even an option for on the fly. Um, uh, as I mentioned, you've got one raster, one raster um, is one zoom level, so you end up with 10 rasters, which is fine. It's only it's a little more disk space, but not actually that much. Um, and uh, the the parameter that you need is the TR uh, in GDAL warp, and that resizes it. Um, the pixel size to use is from the pixel size common column in the grid set on GeoServer. Um, I don't remember how that works, but it worked. Um, I did it several months ago. I can't remember these things. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is a third option for your base map tiles, um, and that's to use vectors to uh, vector data, like master map or open street map. We don't have open street map because it's a pain, um, but we do have master map loaded. So you can use vectors to create um, a base layer, like with uh, geo ideally using GeoServer's layer groups, if you're using GeoServer. Um, so we have s about six different layer groups. So we've got one layer group for each product, and then we've got a layer group of the, six, the five, la five layer groups. Um, and that, in turn, creates an entire zoom stack, um, so to speak, uh, of all of those products. And this is a vector um, mapped one. Uh, you should precede it, because otherwise GeoServer tries to render it on the fly which is OK when you get really zoomed in. But when you're zoomed out, it's trying to load the millions of features from uh, vector map local or vector map district, or even Meridian's actually got quite a lot of features, probably a couple of million features in there. Um, but it's a lot of manual effort to create those layers because you've got to style up. In this case, there's 53 tables, but there's a lot more layers than that within those tables. There's probably one, 200 different styling rules. Um, the outputs, uh, I'm not sure how much of that's going to come through on the projector. That's the original, the first method. Um, the second, the one where you've, we've created, pre-created our tiles, um, the, the ra one raster for one zoom level is in the middle. Um, and as you can see, it looks a lot better um, at the right zoom level. And the third is the vector. Um, and they all have different advantages and disadvantages. Uh, this one's ideal for if you're still using as a WMS, um, because you don't gain the advantage of having them one-to-one. -one. Um, the rasters are good if you actually want a raster base map, because um, some people like the, their OS mapping. Um, and of course, vector data, we can style it however we want. So what we have is a nice contiguous um, styling from strategy all the way down to master map. And it you know, all blends in as compared to uh, regularized rasters, which generally look a mess. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Yep. Um, projections continue to be a pain, um, or at least they're a pain for me. Um, I don't know about everyone else. So what, I've, what we basically do is have everything in British National Grid, because that's easiest. Um, 
The other thing uh, is to make life a lot easier. The projection scales that you use, uh, specifically for tiles, this one is, uh, projection scales you use for um, in the open layers application should be the same as the ones on the geo server. If they're not, your tiles will end up in somewhere else. So it, they get slightly misprojected, or at least they always do for me. Um, so we, we also worked in conjunction with the OpenStreetMap uh, GB project, and they put their, um, they, they actually <coughs> converted their tiles to be the same as ours. So um, everyone else kind of has to use our tiles now for that project. Um, <laughs> There are a couple of gotchas with open layers. Uh, you do need a proxy um, if you're going to use the WFS, because otherwise it, what will happen is you'll end up, um, uh, your browser won't allow you to make the request otherwise because of security concerns. Um, the bigger hidden gotcha is you need to declare your DPI um, in open layers, because the open layers uses 72 dots per inch as its default. Whereas the uh, geo server's dots per inch is 90.714 something. Um, for I don't know why. Um, so if you have the wrong dots per inch, again, your tiles are going to end up in the wrong place. Um, that one took a while to figure out as well. Geo server has a, well, a couple of gotchas, tips really. Um, lower your WFS maximum number of features. Uh, the default's 100,000, meaning if someone makes a query, they can get up to 100,000 features returned. That will kill any browser and probably your server. Um, 7,500 is what we sent it, set it to for our internal systems. For the external systems, we're probably going to set it to 750. That also means that it's harder for someone to perform a denial of service kind of uh, attack on it. Um, the other thing is if you set the, you need to set the response cache headers for each individual layer. Um, and you need to do, uh, if you want that layer to be, um, the tiles to be cached on the client side, so you don't have to keep sending, serving out the same tiles again and again to the same users, because they're all generally looking at the same sorts of areas. Um, going live, um, smaller is better. Um, we uh, use the Google, yeah, the Google Closure compiler um, to basically turn all of that into one minified file, uh, minified JavaScript basically being a bunch of gibberish to humans, but it works. Um, it's not much smaller as you can see, um, but it's faster to load, um, and it ca came with the bonus that the Google Closure compiler actually has a uh, error checking in which alerts us when someone's done something wrong, uh, which they have this week, but I'm not around to fix it. Uh, so, um, yeah. Uh, we went live uh, cunningly on a Friday afternoon. The idea was to spread the load, so half the council would do it on a Friday afternoon. The other half would uh, log in on um, Monday morning. As you can see, I sent the email like there, um, like a few seconds later, half the authorities on it because they've got nothing else to do on a Friday afternoon. Um, yeah, um, this is I uh, think eight cores CPU, so you can see they kind of hammered it, uh, but it did start up. Um, and oh, I went went too far there. Ooh, I'm there. Uh, and there was uh, no lag during it, because again, it's a tile service. It was fine. Um, yep, we got lots of them. Um, we served about 70,000 tiles that day, uh, peak requesting at 41 tiles a second. Um, the norm since then is about 12 tiles a second, 15,000 a day. Um, as a bonus, we have lots of OGC services we can now serve internally. Um, they are, they can be used by any of our systems, um, which we're planning to use. Uh, ideally, we'll have them publicly available, but that's kind of wishful thinking because um, security have to actually say yes. They're going to get to it eventually. Uh, evaluation and conclusions, she's scowling at me. Um, we've had excellent user feedback so far. Uh, very impressive, looks excellent, better than the old system, that's not saying much. Um, yep, um, we also created a video as well um, saying how to use it because some users said, we want something, how do we use it? Um, turns out no one ever actually watched it. One person's watched that video from start to end. Um, so, you know, if you users say they want training materials, they may be lying. Um, <laughs> at least they were. Um, bugs, there are actually, there are bugs, yes, in 
systems. Uh, these are sort of just the ones I reported. Uh, I report a lot of bugs. I get a lot of scales, um, especially from proprietary systems. Um, because despite the fact that those numbers do look quite bad, it's still better than proprietary software. You report bugs with Esri, goes into the system, they deny it's a bug. Eventually, if they accept it's a bug, it goes to America. You never hear from it again. Um, in this case, we c if, with open source, we can pay someone to fix the bug, and it gets fixed. Um, Yep. Costs, uh, as I mentioned, it's a lot cheaper. Um, there isn't a purchase cost. We decided to put some extra money into development, um, which is where the 10 to 30,000 comes from, because we're going to spend a little more. Um, maintenance is cheaper, um, and it took a lot less staff time to do, so the total cost was cheaper. Um, conclusions, as you might notice, I'm sort of wrapping up now very quickly. Um, there are lots of pros. It's easily implemented and extended. Uh, we're not reliant on a single vendor anymore. Previously, as mentioned, we had something not working for two years where our vendor couldn't do anything about it because they're incompetent. Um, this has been recorded, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I haven't ma named them, right? Okay. Um, so, you know, we've got a single vendor. They can't do it. But in this case, we have lots of um, vendors. It's a JavaScript client, okay? You know, half the people in this room can probably fix bugs for it um, if we throw money at them. Um, so that, that's a great big advantage. Um, no more of those are licenses. It's a really big one because I really hate licenses because um, they just keep getting in the way and causing lots of grief. Um, again, it's much cheaper. The cons are there are, yes, still bugs, even with the open source stuff. Um, and it does require an internal skill set. If you go externally, which you can do, cause there are lots of vendors here, they'll charge you lots of money. Um, it will still possibly be cheaper. Um, and you still get a lot of the other benefits, but if you're doing it for savings, um, there you are, and a minute or two late. Um, so that's what it looks like, uh, the advanced version. Do we have any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much for this detailed work, and um, very impressive. Um, so now we have about 10 minutes for the question session for all of our three speakers here. Um, pretty much anything our database searches. Um, because the searches are all WFS, um, it, it's basically it's querying anything in the web feature service that our gazetteer has. So we've got the NLPG, the National Street Gazetteer, uh, 150,000 Gazetteer, a couple of internal searches, road numbers. Uh, there's a whole collection of them. Um, that's using postcode searches, I think. The one on the right is a postcode search. Say the National Street Gazetteer, um, how quickly would you get a result if you couldn't say High Street or something? Um, it depends how good our database is feeling that day. Um, you can get a result inside of a second. Sometimes it's a bit slower. Not sure why. Um, we've indexed the columns, uh, some, but it's usually within a few seconds. Um, yeah. Yes. So what data store are you storing your maps? Uh, Oracle. Um, because all of the council, the council basically has an Oracle database. That's what we're using, corporate database. I'd like to use PostGIS, but there'd be no advantage because the rest of the authority is still mostly on Oracle, so there won't be any saving there for the authority because we're still paying them five, six figures for nothing. Any more questions? Oh, lots. Catch me afterward if you like, but yes. Um, yep. We're trying to replace all of our previous systems with this one. So far, only about half the users have transitioned. Being a county council, as ever, there are people who don't like to progress too much uh, for one reason or another. Um, so they're still using the old systems. We're going to push them over, whether they like it or not. Um, we, we're still running the old system. It's, we just have no support. So if it breaks, it breaks. Um, ideally, it will break someday soon so I can get rid of it. But it hasn't yet. Um, I haven't broken it intentionally yet. That might be tomorrow. Um, yes. Sorry. Um, is there, are there any plans to integrate with other council systems, such as 
Can you say what the basis of the Planning Applications be able to use? Yes, yes. Um, basically, we use FME behind the scenes to get all of our data into our corporate database. FME's uh, data translation loader is a proprietary one. Uh, they're actually very good at fixing bugs. They're one of the rare exceptions. Um, but the we, we so we just need to be able to read their data and stick it into our data store. And the second it's in our data store, we can access it through this. Um, conversely, our systems can access this using the D WMS, the WFS, any of the OGC services. Um, but Again, proprietary systems don't usually do OGC services, or if they do, they don't do it well. Um, even um, ArcGIS has quite a lot of bugs with them, but then QGIS does too. Yeah. Sorry, there's a question back there, uh, or maybe you left. At the moment, it's a silly design tool. Okay. So, so it's, like, it's, so it's for random certified surveys. Mm -hmm. You can create your strata from a basic coastline in QGIS. Mm -hmm. Then create your strata into zones of high, low, medium, abundance, whatever. Right. And then generate random transects or points to sample within that strata. Mm -hmm. We have three surveys going here at the moment designed by that. Mm -hmm. And the next step will be to work with the people analysing the survey results mm -hmm. to add an analysis tool to the survey design tool so they can then design the survey, carry out the survey and analyse the results as part of a single tool. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, this, the silver strike CMS that you had developed, presumably that's proprietary. No. That's open source? It's totally open source. It's PHP based. It's, um, it's, it's PHP based. Yeah. Its claim to fame was for the democratic, um, the last democratic election. They used the Silver Strike for their website, and as you can imagine, on election night it got quite a few hits, and it coped faultlessly. So it's, it's not the it's not the 800 pound gorilla like WordPress or Drupal, but. Um, it has its own solid user base. The uh, chief technology officer is an ex-GIS person, and the opportunity to work on a tool like this within a CMS was made his heart beat with joy. Um, his boss said the weekend after we interviewed them for this job, I've never seen a German so excited. <laughs> so, yep. Um. I have another question for our second speaker, just personal interest. <laughs> um, I wonder, like for the majority companies and the individuals in Korea, what's the most popular software, like just for mapping? Because mm -hmm. I know in most areas it will be either ArcGIS or Quantum GIS. I just wonder if that's the same case in Korea at the moment? Uh, actually, around 50% of Korean market is dominate, dominated by uh, SC product. Okay. and others, but uh, uh, with the advent of the QGIS, nowadays, the, now we can see the growing number of the QGIS, QGIS users. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. uh, just a quick comment, because I'm from China, and I think in China at the moment, most people are still using uh, SRI product, and uh, at least that what I was saying university, that was six years ago, and I was taught uh, ArcMap 9.2, I think. So, um, so yeah, I think open source software is quite widely accepted in China. That's just my personal uh, point. So, do we have any more questions from this session? I think um, the, you know, we were a bit late. Uh, so, the next session starts at quarter past one. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.